howling at speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. These winds drive the most destructive of all natural forces, a hurricane. Every 15 seconds, it would just go. And, and, and the house would shake with that. Exposing buildings as flimsy shelters and pushing giant walls of water on shore that drown everything in their path. It just, boom. I felt this just rise up into the air. I could hear the water surrounding me. I could feel it. The punishing force of a hurricane leaves massive destruction in its wake. And as coastlines grow crowded, more are at risk from Earth's violent fury of hurricanes. There's a special horror to hurricanes. Their power goes well beyond having the most destructive winds on Earth. They carry an arsenal of destruction. Airborne missiles. Flash floods and unstoppable storm surges. It was like an animal. It was like an animal out of control in, in, in a fury, in, in its rage. And you were, you were in its path trying to uh, defend yourself, and uh, you had nowhere to run. John Demo survived the worst hurricane ever to hit the Caribbean island of St. Croix. People prefer to think of the Virgin Islands as paradise. Bountiful sunshine and warm ocean waters create delightful tropical breezes. But these are the conditions that can also spin into deadly storms, according to hurricane expert Bob Sheets. The tropics are always conditionally unstable. It's warm, it's humid. Get something to start, some cloud to grow, or whatever it is. Get that to start to be organized and concentrated. You end up with a tropical storm or hurricane. As moist air rises in the tropics, a storm cloud may form. Given a spin from the rotating Earth, the intensifying storm turns like a giant pinwheel. If conditions are right, the storm builds in strength, turning faster in a tightening spiral. When the wind rises above 74 miles an hour, a hurricane is born six miles high and hundreds of miles across. In September 1989, at the U.S. National Hurricane Center, Dr. Sheets determines that a major storm is brewing in the Caribbean. Another Miami resident is excited by the news. Jim Leonard is one of a small breed of adventurers known as hurricane chasers. He rushes to intercept the storm in the Virgin Islands. I chase hurricanes because I've always been impressed by strong winds. It's kind of an adrenaline rush to uh, watch, you know, this kind of power in nature, you know, before your eyes. Jim will get his wish soon enough. For all activity, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and Puerto Rico remain in hurricane condition one with winds of 120 knots, gusting to 140 knots. As the storm approaches the isolated island of St. Croix, there is no escape. So Jan Hanley stays home and holds a hurricane party, which son Chris records on videotape. Everybody had kind of an exciting feeling, but a nervous feeling. And I don't think anybody was really totally afraid because they kept saying we can sustain 130 mile an hour winds quite easily. Wait, John, you got things under control? Under control. All right, so hey, we're just getting warmed up for this party. Then. I know, bro. 
But no one at Jan's hurricane party has ever experienced a hurricane. It's kind of like having a day off of school, or it was sort of exciting, and the winds were picking up, the weather was getting bad. You could see the overcast clouds were moving in. And as the storm approached, the rough ocean, coupled with surge, resulted in waves actually coming into the town. I would say that probably we've got a hurricane coming. <laughs> and not just any hurricane. It'll be the worst storm in recorded history to hit St. Croix. Hugo makes landfall late in the day, with winds exceeding 140 miles an hour. When the power goes out, the party continues by candlelight, while the wind builds, shaking the house with ever-increasing force. John Demo has never experienced anything like this. Every 15 seconds, it would just go. And, and, and the house would shake with that. And, and every 15 seconds, this is what would happen. And it just, it was just, it was like a howling animal. You could feel the force of the wind was vibrating the structure of the house. All of a sudden, the shutters that we had secured to the outside, the windows and doors on the house, one of them ripped off. My first thought was, well, let's support this glass. Two or three of us pushed against it. And we were holding it for probably a good half an hour when all of a sudden the kitchen window blew in. It was as if someone had taken a shotgun and just blown out the kitchen window. When the windows begin to explode one by one, the guests crowd into the bedroom, their last hope. It was just a matter of, of total fright. I think everybody in that room thought they were going to die. While Jan and her guests pray their shelter will hold, on nearby Puerto Rico, storm chaser Jim Leonard is getting more than he bargained for. When we were up in the balcony area, we were uh, filming the debris flying across the parking lot, and a lot of that junk that was in the parking lot would fly up, so we kind of figured we'd better move down to the parking garage where it's surrounded by concrete instead of glass. Like the partygoers in St. Croix, Jim retreats to a windowless refuge. Hugo howls at them through the concrete walls. It is so awesome. And it's a very eerie sound, and it's loud, and it goes on for hours and hours. You feel like you're trapped by it. I can see how some people feel like the, it's the end of the world. You know, they have no way out of there. There's nowhere to go but to continue down that stairway. Hurricane chasers find refuge behind concrete. But what a world they see outside. Well, I've always thought how vulnerable you know, we are, how fragile human life is against the element of nature, you know, especially after I've watched something like that. Back on St. Croix, the winds begin to recede. After eight hours in the bedroom, Jan and her guests venture out. But they're shocked at what they discover. Oh my God! It was like a bomb. I mean, it's, it's just like somebody let a bomb off in, in the living room. If you can imagine a, a horror film where that whistling, scary, sound of wind blowing hard through dead trees or something. That was everywhere, and it was scary. As the winds begin to die, the shock sets in. The once green island is completely denuded of foliage. 
Jan's home is severely damaged. Here's the house, the window's smashed. And this, this is one section that survived, because if it hadn't, we'd be probably even dead. Or Making his way across the island, Chris Hanley discovers that more than 90% of the buildings have been damaged. Houses that once stood on hilltops vanished overnight. Thousands are left homeless. I saw on TV once a show uh, the day after uh, a nuclear attack, and that's exactly what I felt like, like nuclear warheads had been dropped on St. Croix. But the human side of the disaster has only begun. Power, water, and phone service will be out for months. Most people that we, we met as we were going along were in sort of a daze. Emily, um, a good friend of ours, she was in a daze when I went to her house. When I got there, she was wiping off the kitchen counter, and there's no roof on the house. The psychological shock repeated itself all over the island at the enormity of the loss. The sheer terror like I've never felt before. Uh, just feeling that we were going to die, you know, that, that was just completely As people start to realize the total devastation of their once beautiful island, some seek out psychiatrists like Olaf Hendricks. For most of us, we were experiencing new heights of vulnerability and exposure, uh, both physically and socially, culturally, and, and even spiritually, we felt that we were abandoned by God. With the government overwhelmed, looters run rampant. There's no police force, there's no military, there's no National Guard, there's nothing. So everybody was kind of on their own. We heard gunshots here at the house um, in the evening, which was frightening. We have no protection. We're we're no the police are watching everybody here. loot. They're just watching everybody steal everything. We just want to go home. After three days of civil disorder, the U.S. government sends in more than 1,000 troops. St. Croix's long recovery has begun. We happened to be there when we saw the first C-47 touch ground. And it was like, they do care. They are coming. We are going to get help. But many residents lived without roofs, power, or phones for months. Disaster became a way of life. In the five years after Hugo, three more hurricanes swept St. Croix. While some residents have abandoned the island, most have stayed. Jan Hanley has rebuilt her house, and John Demo is building one for his family out of concrete. Living here in St. Croix, in Hurricane Alley, it takes away that security. And yet, we live here and love it. It's a very strange thing that we deal with. But the U.S. Virgin Islands aren't the only target of Caribbean storms as hurricane disaster heads for the U.S. mainland. Thousands of people choose the small, peaceful islands off the Carolina coast as the perfect place for beach houses, just yards from the ocean and a few feet above sea level. But living here is playing weather roulette because the flat coastline is plagued by hurricanes that can drive the ocean far on shore in a powerful wall of water called a storm surge. Andy! Whenever you see large loss of life in hurricanes around the world, tropical storms, hurricanes, tropical cyclones, typhoons, they're all the same thing around the world. It's always from water, the rising waters in general, these rising coastal waters are the result of powerful cyclonic winds that push a massive swell of water on shore. While it's high velocity winds that make the headlines, it's storm surge that's the unexpected killer. We had families actually coming down to take a look at the storm. It might look very spectacular, but I, I really uh, suggest that you stay at home and watch these pictures on television. We're very careful in keeping an eye on the storm surge as it comes up. 
the deadly power of storm surges has rarely been photographed. But hurricane chaser Jim Leonard caught one on tape in Guam, though it may be more accurate to say the storm surge caught him. These waves are crashing 100 yards inland from where they normally break. Storm surges are capable of pushing miles inland, rising more than 20 feet above sea level. Great. Oh, great. Of all the savage forces of hurricanes, storm surge is the most dangerous. In the summer of 1996, Joni Johnson and Kimberly McLam have already survived one hurricane as another approaches. The last hurricane Bertha, it didn't do much damage to our house and we decided to stay. The two women live upstairs in a beach house on a sea level bit of land known as Topsail Island. And when Hurricane Fran bears down on the North Carolina coast, winds up to 120 miles per hour push breakers to Joni and Kim's doorstep. About three, four o'clock, it was really getting bad. At that time, we actually saw people's decks just swarming by in the water. The women think of escape, but it's too late. The only bridge has been washed out. Sergeant Ron Shanahan sets up a roadblock at the missing bridge. There's no power, the winds and the storm surge is coming, and uh, we just got eerie feeling, hoping that nobody was out there. And then the noises started to happen, I guess about 6 o'clock. The first noise I heard just scared me. I thought, what in the world is that? It's the sound of the waves surging through the first floor of the house as the two women huddle upstairs. The windows are busted through now. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And finally, around 8 o'clock, it actually felt like the house was just barely even hanging on. I was thinking, gosh, we're really close to, to death because we knew that other houses and other things were going on into the water. A deadly storm surge is hammering Topsail Island. At that time, the noise was getting worse and worse. And it was just within seconds. It just boom. And I felt this just rise up into the air. The storm surge lifts the house and tips it sideways. I could hear the water surrounding me. I could feel it. I was scared to death. I thought I was going to just slide on in. In the growing darkness, the two women leap from a window into seawater up to their chests. We latched each other's arms. The wind was over 100 miles an hour at this moment. And we fell. We lost each other two or three times trying to get across the debris. Joni and Kimberly crawl through a broken window into a neighboring beach house, only to find it swaying dangerously on its stilts. So we got into the bathtub, we pulled the mattress over our heads. The noise of the storm out there, it was just, it continued on, it seemed never ending. Joni and Kimberly are cut off from any hope of rescue. Chief Jones advised me that there was two young ladies that had called in stating that the waves were coming over their residence and they needed help. Obviously, he stated to me to try to get some sleep, and it was impossible for me to get sleep uh, thinking what we were going to face in the morning. Are we going to face two fatalities, these two young ladies? Dawn brings a numbing portrait of Fran's power. Hundreds of homes are in ruins. Some have simply vanished. We were we weren't really expecting uh, that, to find any survivors. It took us probably about an hour and a half to walk a mile and a half. Uh, again, we were in the water up to our knees. Sand was flying everywhere, and I started blowing my police whistle, hoping that these two girls would would hear it.
Joni and Kimberly have returned to the wreckage of their house, now collapsed down to one story. And I just kept thanking God. I just said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. The two women are lucky. Fran killed 16 people that night. Six thousand people lost their lives in 1900 when a storm surge hit Galveston, Texas. Most of them drowned when a wall of water blasted across the low-lying city. It caused more deaths than any other natural disaster in U.S. history. When storm surge hit Bangladesh, it caused the world's deadliest natural disaster. At least once each decade, a tropical cyclone pushes the Indian Ocean over this low-lying coast, causing massive destruction. When floodwaters receded in 1970, a catastrophe of biblical proportions was revealed. Over 300,000 people had drowned. There are six alive. How many were there in the family? 25 there. They were mostly children, were they? All the children and his wife, he lost his wife mother. and lost his mother. In many villages, every child was washed away. A generation of people lost in an hour. The real loss of life there was probably closer to a million because you had about the 300,000 to 500,000 directly drowned at the time of the hurricane. But then you had all the diseases afterwards, and then you had the starvation and all of that. And so they felt that the real loss there was about a million people. Storm surge can engulf any coastline in a hurricane-prone area. It is a terror that few people expect. But an experience that changes them for life. Fran to me means a very scary situation. It just, it gives me chills to even think about it. As Joni says, it's a, it's a monster. Now we're just picking up the pieces and trying to go forward. Evacuation prevented a greater loss of life in Hurricane Fran, but the lost homes and dislocated lives will haunt the region for years to come. Is there no way to prevent this level of destruction The day after Fran, experts head out to look for answers in the wreckage of the devastated North Carolina coastline. In Irish folklore, a banshee wails outside a home as a warning that death is near. Along tropical coastlines, a howling wind announces the arrival of a very real deadly force, a hurricane. Hurricanes are categorized by wind force on a scale of one to five. A wildly destructive category five hurricane has sustained winds above 155 miles an hour with gusts well over 200. Only two category five hurricanes have hit the United States in this century. The most destructive was Camille in 1969 striking Mississippi with a 25-foot high storm surge. 500 people were killed. Survivors are left in shock at the wind's destructive force. Even a Category 2 hurricane exacts a terrible toll. It's the morning after Hurricane Fran ripped across the North Carolina coast. Peter Sparks is a wind damage expert who has studied some of the worst hurricane damage to American coasts. The 
devastating, absolutely devastating. <laughs> Dr. Sparks rushes a team from Clemson University into the heart of the destruction. In Wilmington, they inspect a motel that lost its roof, like so many older building designs. I was right up there in that room. In a second, the roof was gone. Was just... By examining the construction flaws of the missing roof and other damage, the team hopes to prevent this kind of destruction in the future. It was just like a, a sail. The wind got underneath it, and away it went. But it's also extremely dangerous if you have these things flying around. Um, danger of uh, landing in another hotel next to it or houses nearby. And occasionally we do kill people by having parts of one building falling on another building. A cherished piece of history, the First Baptist Church, lost a steeple to Fran. The tiles coming off roofs is a sign of a particular wind speed. It's a sign of uh, storm force conditions on the Beaufort scale. So it's a pretty good indicator in, of what Wilmington experienced. In a wind tunnel laboratory at Clemson University, the team recreates wind damage to actual buildings. Tiny air tubes on the surface of each model building carry the wind pressures to measuring devices. Smoke reveals the wind flow patterns, while crossed laser beams measure the wind velocities. It's a race against time to construct better buildings before the next great disaster. A model of downtown Houston helps engineers observe the chaotic wind forces that push and swirl between large buildings. Just as the real life skyscrapers of Houston were pummeled by Hurricane Alicia in 1983. You can get high wind speeds between buildings. And because of those high wind speeds, you can get high suction. It's extremely dangerous to have large panes of glass coming out 30, 40, 50 stories above the sidewalk, landing in the street below. If there's a lesson, it's to prepare for the worst, because the worst can happen. And Peter Sparks witnessed the worst in his study of Hurricane Andrew, in which a Category 4 hurricane hit a heavily populated area in South Florida. Hurricane Andrew was probably the most extensive example of wind damage that we have seen in any industrialized country. The damaging winds begin the afternoon of August 24th, 1992, as Andrew bears down on the Florida coastline, barely missing Miami. But cutting across South Florida like a buzzsaw, with gusting winds clocked at 175 miles per hour. Like most hurricanes, it generates its most powerful gusts after making landfall. That's because the rougher surfaces of the land create greater wind turbulence. It's a destructive scenario. Daybreak reveals the worst destruction the U.S. has ever seen. 63,000 homes are destroyed. Emergency services are stretched to the limit. The storm has left 26 people dead and hundreds more injured. Like me, I'm homeless completely. I don't have anything. I mean, nothing. Completely nothing. So I don't know what I'm going to do. Property damage, much of it resulting from poor construction, exceeds $25 billion. It's the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. Most of the damage could have been prevented with very little increase in cost of construction because the damage was the result of minor failures of the structure. In hurricanes of the future, more homes may be built to withstand the wind's destructive force. 
Improved construction techniques are becoming both effective and affordable. Metal straps hold roofs in place. Five, four, three, two, Laminated one. glass stands up to airborne missiles. The important thing is to recognize the risk and to design our buildings, our cities, our infrastructure to account for that. In learning to survive hurricanes, scientists also study the inner workings of these whirlwinds. What makes the hurricane so brutally damaging is a ring of fury surrounding the eye of the storm, known as the eye wall. As the rising winds of the center suck in surrounding air, the converging winds spin faster and faster, creating the destructive speeds in the eye wall. You don't need a weatherman to tell you when the eye wall has hit. This is really eye wall city. Yeah. Definitely. When the eye of Hurricane Bertha passes over Surf City, North Carolina, a man and his dog take a grave risk by going out to meet the storm, eye to eye. How long do you get to be in here? How many times do you get to be in the eye of a hurricane? All right, there it is, right up in it. Staring up a shaft 30,000 feet high, a patch of clear sky shines like a glimpse of heaven. Human and hurricane meet for a few precious minutes. The eye's closing in. I think we're about to get in the second half. As the eye moves on, the other half of the eye wall arrives to continue its rampage. But the biggest monsters are born in the Pacific Ocean, and one is headed for Hawaii. Massive flooding in the Philippines shows the immense destructive power of cyclones born in the Pacific Ocean. Traditionally known as typhoons in the western half of the Pacific and hurricanes in the eastern half. These are the largest storm systems on the planet. Bumping into few land masses to slow their growth, these enormous whirlwinds can become sea monsters a thousand miles across. Massive, even from space. And never we're hanging onto our chairs. This is the way to see hurricanes. Well, we hope you're high enough that you're gonna pass over it. The rainfall of typhoons is legendary. Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean was once hit with 19 feet of rainfall over nine days. They also put muscle behind ocean waves. A typhoon off Tahiti sent these sea swells 4,000 miles across the Pacific, powerful enough to chase these California surfers out of the water. When it's calm, the Pacific attracts those who seek an island way of life. But there's a price to living in paradise. On the Hawaiian island of Kauai, weather conditions create a tropical paradise. But every so often, the weather goes awry, as Shannon Kay discovered. The first day of the hurricane, the weather was uh, pretty nice. It was actually very beautiful. And then it started getting pretty cloudy and dark and luminous. A Category 4 hurricane called Aniki is brewing in the Pacific in August of 1992. On another part of the island, Tony Wickman wants his family off the island, but there's no time. When we heard the hurricane was a four, we started panicking, and we ran outside, gathered some wood to board up the windows, and that was about all we could do. The hurricane makes landfall in the afternoon. Shannon Kay and her family are stranded in their home. You could hear the roof shaking and everything rattling, and it did not sound like we should be inside. We went back and sat in the truck, and, and you could see my roof lifting up off of the, the top of the house, and 
and flopping up and down in the wind. My mom was yelling at me because I was up, and she wanted me to stay down, duck down in the truck. But that was the weirdest thing, seeing everybody's roofs flying down the street. Flying debris hits the truck. They decide to escape, but that means driving through the hurricane. We had feelings of dying, and because we had watched the news the night before of Florida getting hit by Hurricane Andrew and saw all the houses that were flattened and leveled. The family spends five agonizing hours in the truck as gusts reach 175 miles an hour. You could not hear anything else. You couldn't hear yourself breathing or talking. You couldn't hear anyone asking you anything unless it was a full yell with eye contact. It was that loud. Tony leads his family to a downstairs studio off the main house, a decision that saves their lives as the top floor loses its roof. Then the remaining ceiling and walls of the first floor vibrate in the wind. It danced like I've never seen wood dance before. It literally bowed and buckled and swayed until piece by piece all four walls blew in. Tony joins his family in the downstairs studio, the one surviving room of the house. We both stood there and cried for a minute because um, the house meant so much. Other residents have sought safety at the Sheraton Hotel, the designated community shelter. But even here, they find themselves trapped in the terror of Aniki. They experience the fury of the storm and wonder if their shelter will go next. As night approaches, there is no safe haven from Aniki. The morning light reveals Aniki's destruction. I got up pre-dawn and opened the door. It was a beautiful morning. But as I walked outside and realized uh, the damage I sustained, it, I started to cry a little bit. Hawaii has had its share of vicious storms, but none was more destructive than this. Nearly every building on the island suffered damage. One man was killed by flying debris. Two fishermen died at sea. It was until like the next day that I really felt like I had been traumatized and my family had really been put through a lot. It really taught everybody a lesson on what is very important in life. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. We were lucky we were alive. A hurricane creates indelible memories. For many survivors, the aftermath brings lingering fears to the surface. So they, needed, they came to my door and knocked and asked if I needed help. I would immediately start crying. And, and I wasn't real sure why I was crying, but I think that it was just the stress and the emotion, emotional feelings I got after the hurricane of seeing everything blown apart and destroyed before my eyes. It just really took about a year to re fully recover from everything and getting our house painted and the roof patched. One disaster is enough to test the endurance of any human being, but millions could be threatened. What would happen if a hurricane were to devastate a major city? Record is a hurricane warning. The next bulletin for the National oh, Hurricane Center is direct hit on St. Croix and St. Thomas. Major the devastation there. The, the city of Surfside is just about completely evacuated. Every time a hurricane approaches the U.S. coastline, it's the same drill. The hurricane flags go up. Homes are sealed off. 
Roads are clogged. All attempts to escape the savage force of the storm. Sooner or later, experts say, a major city will be devastated. Bob Sheets has studied the worst case scenario for New Orleans. There is no way that we're going to be able to move all people out of harm's way when a hurricane threatens. And New Orleans is the prime example of that. The studies have shown that to evacuate the city of New Orleans, which lies below sea level, surrounded by water, would take somewhere around 80 hours. Picture a Category 4 hurricane approaching New Orleans. There's a 48-hour advance warning that results in jammed evacuation routes. But many don't heed the warning until it's too late. They are trapped as the hurricane hits. Storm surge raises the Mississippi Delta 15 feet. The entire city is flooded. Power and communications are cut off. The chaos causes civil disturbances. And the death toll could be staggering. It may not be New Orleans. Florida's Gulf Coast population is packed like sardines from Tampa to the Everglades. It's realistic to think that uh, in the next 20, 30 years, Florida is going to see hurricane destruction like it's never previously seen. There is almost a classic of a storm system, isn't it? Dr. William Gray is one of the world's leading experts on hurricane prediction. Using geological evidence and other things, we've been able to reconstruct in the past that there are these natural cycles that go 20, 30 years of more active seasons and 20, 30 years of inactive seasons. Dr. Gray sees evidence of an upswing in hurricane activity. It's a very ominous forecast to have because we're undoubtedly going to see hurricane damage much greater than we've ever previously seen it because there's been such a buildup of pro people and property values along the southeast coast since the last active period. It's not just population growth in the United States. 65% of Asia's 3 billion people live in coastal areas. Viewed at night from space, the continents are edged in bright light revealing dense coastal populations across the globe, from Hong Kong to Cancun. I believe hurricanes are the greatest natural threat facing us, more than earthquakes, more than floods, more than tornadoes, and these other natural phenomena that do damage. The hurricane risk goes up as many coastline residents fail to take the brutal force of a hurricane seriously. It's, it's unsurfable right now, so we might as well swim in it. But we hung these curtains up, man, just in case the glass breaks. It won't blow in on us, because we'll be all here partying while it happens. Just trying to be safe, you know? We, none of us wants to get hurt, but we love storms. We want to ride this thing all the way. Choosing to face hurricane winds is foolhardy. But sometimes, there is no choice. One of the things that I uh, tried to push uh, as uh, director of the National Hurricane Center was what I called a last resort refuge plan. And basically, that last resort refuge plan says, get as many people out as you can possibly get out. But understand, there are going to be times when you're not going to get everybody out. We must have homes that people can stay in before, during, and after the hurricane. For now, abandoning an area in the path of a hurricane is an American's best recourse. But on the other side of the world, another country is taking defensive action against hurricanes. Bangladesh, which has suffered the world's worst cyclone disasters, has been building a system of levees to protect its low-lying coastal areas from storm surge and flooding. Despite its fragile economy, Bangladesh has managed to construct hundreds of cyclone shelters. 
combined with a warning system and ongoing drills, the emergency system may help avoid future catastrophes. Millions of coastal residents around the world may someday face their own Andrew or Hugo or Fran. How will they respond to the threat? Those who have experienced past hurricanes know what it takes to survive. Certainly, next time I even hear of one coming, I'm prepared. Now when I hear that there's a hurricane that might be approaching, um, I take it more seriously. And I think that next time I would go to a shelter. Prepare for the worst. Imagine you, that your house is going to blow away. And prepare it that way. Battering winds, airborne missiles, storm surge. The Earth's fury returns every hurricane season. It's a threat many live with. A threat many will struggle to survive.